Welcome, everybody. And today I'm going to talk about practice makes perfect when it comes to RxJS. So before I start deep to dive into that topic particularly, I want to tell a quick story to set the stage. So RxJS reminds me, at least the way I learned it, always like riding a bicycle. The way I learned riding a bicycle was pretty much my parents sat me on this bicycle and I drove it and hit the uh, fence of my neighbors. Um, but every time you're doing that, you keep practicing and repeating that and getting better and better with it. And after a certain amount of time, you get really professional with it. At least that's the way it is for riding a bicycle. And I think the same goes for RxJS. So at least the way I learned it was always by continuous cycles of practicing and understanding more about the API, the way RxJS works and stuff like that. So quick Two sentences about me. It's already mentioned. I'm a consultant at Evora IT. I'm since mid of 2018. I think I'm a member of the RxJS core team. I'm doing Twitch streams once to twice a week, maybe something like that. Um, I'm also organizing a meetup. And if you don't want to talk to me about any kind of tech stuff, that's totally fine for me. Uh, I also love to talk about steak and whiskey, so we definitely have some common ground to for chatting. OK, back to RxJS. So when you start to learn RxJS, it pretty much you get uh, swamped with all these expressions. And you kind of feel like, oh, what do I really need to know all of that to be professional with RxJS? Um, no, just, just like that, no. Um, the thing about RxJS, it's not all about these kind of things that are listed here on the screen. RxJS is more about. Um, leveraging the observable type. And therefore, once a very, very smart man told me, uh, observables don't cause problem. That's not the difficult part of RxJS. Establishing a reactive mindset, that's difficult. This is the challenge that you need to overcome when you want to get professional with RxJS. And maybe if you've learned a foreign language, because that's pretty comparable to learning RxJS from my point of view even though in this slideshow for time reasons, I kicked out the slides. Okay, so I will share the slideshow later. There you can see why it's similar to learning a different language. What I want to do is actually helping you establishing this reactive mindset. And therefore, what I want to do is doing some live coding. My slide designing skills are really bad anyway, so I thought like, well, maybe do some live coding that might be easier. Um, and therefore, we. What I want to do, let me firstly show what I want to do, is implementing such a Caruso with RxJS. So we have mouse navigation, which is like a swipe thingy. We have keyboard navigation. Um, and we have an automatic timer that just goes to the next slide after a certain amount of time. So these are the key features of our Caruso that we are now going to implement with RxJS. All of this is wrapped in an Angular component so far. Um, but it's pretty heavy on RxJS and therefore rather agnostic to Angular. Um, all the source code, code will be shared afterwards, so don't worry too much about that right now. Just focus on what I'm doing and follow me. So I already prepared some stuff because I'm definitely not able to code all of that live. Um, so what we he have here is uh, starting point observable. So what I want to start now is the swipe gesture. Um, and I want to support touch gestures and mouse gestures. Um, please don't get confused by this prevent event propagation. The thing was, uh, the when I started to click on the image, my slides went to the next page, and therefore I had to stop the event propagation there. Um, so this is the touch start observable. And we use this touch start observable here to, as our starting point for our swipe gesture. So as soon as the touch start happens, we want to listen all, to all the touch moves in between, because this is pretty much what the swipe is, right? You click down, move the mouse, and you release it. This is the swipe gesture. So we start with a switch map operator here. And I don't want you to know about all these operators. I, what I want you to show is how to establish this reactive mindset by continuous practice, but also the capabilities of RxJS. These are the important key takeaways here. OK, um, so we get in the touch start event here, and we then subscribe to our touch move 
where I pass this event. This event is then used for the delta calculation from the start to the end point. So here again, I'm merging touch and mouse gestures together. Um, the next thing I'm now going to do is using the observe on operator to specify a scheduler. There is a really great talk about schedulers in general in RxJS by Michael Lapke, who is also doing a talk today. Um, you can find it on YouTube somewhere. Check it out. It's really good. So uh, this is just like a minor performance improvement here. The next thing I want to do, I already said it. Uh, swipe gesture is uh, recognizing all the touch movements until we release the mouse. So we say, OK, just uh, take values until you get a value either from um, uh, a mouse up. It is the mouse, mouse move, mouse down, mouse up, yes, um, or a touch end event. I hope the font size is big enough. Um, if not, I ask someone from the organizers to jump into the stream and just tell me. Um, but it's already fairly big on my screen, so I, <laughs> I hope it's good. Um, OK, so now we said, OK, uh, as soon as the user clicks down, listen to all the movement move events in between till the user touches up. Uh, what we now want to do is calculate del delta between. And I have prepared a method for that because I'm not able to do this in life. Um, and this is also the way you would write custom RxS operator on your own. Um, I don't want to go into the details on that. I just use that here. Uh, this dot calculate delta. There I pass the start event and the number of elements that I have in here in this car whole carousel. The very last thing is, um, if I would now uh, leave it like it is, it would emit all the values in between. And if you have ever subscribed to events, those are emitted super often. Uh, what I'm really just interested in is that in the very last value before the user released, because this will give me the whole delta from my start point to the end point. So this is already our swipe gesture. And now we got the delta of the movement in between, which we can then use here to see if the user wants to go to the previous page or the next page, or not at all, because there's also like a certain threshold that the user hit, have to hit, has to hit. Um, so now what I'm going to do, because I want to uh, implement left and right arrows, and pretty much they are be, um, treated the same. I will merge them together later in this events observable. So I will start here with swipe. So let's see, because this should already work. I have a small demo application here. It needs to recompile, but at least the swipe not sh should now work. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate the touch gesture, as so I don't have a touch screen, but it, it was working, I promise. Uh, so this is also code that is running in production right now. Not exactly like that, but more or less. OK, coming to the left and right arrow. We're still leveraging from event, which is just subscribing to an event and wrapping that in an observable. And in this particular case, we are interested in the key down event. So but we are not interested in all key down events for a keyboard with 100 keys. Uh, we are just interested in some of them for certain keys. Um, one quick information here, event or from event is not super well typed. So I will just specify the type here. Um, and I want to see if event.key is the string, right? Or is key code? I think key is the string. Uh, it's equals to key A. I will use A and B uh, because it's the same for left and right error. This will trigger my slides. Um, and then the only thing we need to do is as soon as the signal comes, we just want to map the value to um, this point go to previous page. And this is just one value less than the threshold so that the user will go to the previous slide. OK. Uh, we were at the left arrow. And actually, the right arrow works pretty much the same. 
just the fact that instead of key A, we are using key B here. And we want to go to the next slide. Go to the next page. So we now merge that in together here. Left and right arrow. And we are already subscribing to the events observable down below here. So let's see if that is working. Is it already recompiled? Now it is recompiled, but it's not working. And OK, instead of doing a live coding session, let's make it a live debugging session, because I'm, apparently I did this wrong. So I will check the, uh, quickly check what event is emitted here. Open the dev console. There we go. And it is key D or code key D. I mess that up all the time. OK, so it's code. Very intuitive names. Cap and console lock is, by the way, the best way to debug RxJS. Uh, OK, so now key D is working. I'm not using the mouse anymore. But let's come to the last part, the timer itself. So timer kind of makes sense to uh, leverage interval, which is just using set interval under the hood. Uh, but the thing is, we want to restart our interval as soon as an event happened. So as soon as one of those emitted something, we want our timer to restart. Therefore, what we can do is using take until and pass our events observable to that. As soon as uh, events will now emit something, our timer will stop. Uh, or it's particularly complete. So one thing we should do here is actually multicast our observable of events, because otherwise, all the event listener under the hood would be registered twice, which is not intended behavior. Um, now, because as soon as one of those events happen, our timer will complete, we want to restart it, right? And therefore, now that we have the complete sign due to the take until, we can leverage repeat when. And repeat when takes a notifier observable that will emit something as soon as the source observable completes. And we need to return a new observable uh, or an observable. And as soon as that one emits something, we will, resubs we will resubscribe to our source observable. So this is pretty much these two lines can be read as resubscribe, um, uh, resubscribe when. Resubscribe when the event observable emits something. OK. And there are two minor things now missing. So one thing is automatically, as soon as the interval is hit, uh, emitting something, go to the next page, map to this, go to next page. And because it's an automatic timer, I would like to that it goes to the first slide automatically when it's circling through. This is kind of intuitive from my point of view. Uh, and therefore, I'm just using a tab for a side effect here, and I also prefer for prepared uh, alpha method for that, which is animate back to first slide. I'm, I'm very good with names. Um, and there I'm again passing the items. And now let's see if that is already enough. I'm not doing anything. And within five seconds, it should go to the next slide. Amazing. OK, I'm well aware that this was maybe a little bit fast. So we will go through that just one more time to recap it really quick. Um, so we started with the swipe feature. And therefore, we had uh, we merged together the touch and the mouse gestures, as we can treat them very similar. The only thing is that touch supports multi-touch gestures. And therefore, we had to get just one touch event out of it. Um, so then we took this touch start as a just as a starting signal for our swipe gesture and subscribed to all the touch moves with the switch map operator. Afterwards, within the touch move, we again subscribe to touch move and mouse move. And we used the animation frame scheduler just to make the animations a little bit more smooth. Afterwards, using take until to specify when our move gesture is ending. And it's ending as soon as either mouse up or touch end is coming or emitting something. So here's, again, the calculation logic. This is really just the uh, calculating the delta from the start point to the current position of the cursor. Uh, and therefore, also animating the slide already a little bit in according to the movement. The take loss is really important, as we just want to emit the last value of our movement 
as soon as our source observer completes, which is the case when uh, touch end or mouse up comes, emit something, then we will emit the last value that was emitted and none value in between is emitted. Um, merging all them together because we can treat them similarly. And here again, we merge them with timer. Timer is a little bit special, therefore I had it separately. And this is just the logic for going back and forth to the, to the slides and check for the thresholds. And don't forget to unsubscribe in your code. Uh, on observables, I used to take until pattern here. There are several blogs po blog posts about that if you want to read about that. And even more important than unsubscribing for an observable is actually subscribing to it. Uh, like most of the time when I think like, okay, I just is so stupid, nothing is working, I just forgot to unsubscribe uh, to subscribe. But this was already our swipe feature. And as soon as we had the swipe feature implemented, it was just a little bit of extra code that we need to write to add the uh, keyboard uh, support. So we did from event again with key down. We filtered out all events that are happening on the key code, key code A. Um, so that we just we could also use left and right arrow. It doesn't really matter. Um, as soon as the signal comes, we say, okay, please uh, emit the value for the threshold for going to the previous page. And the same goes for right arrow, just that it's the emitting the threshold for the going to the next page. Uh, here's again the calculation logic for that. It's basic math, one less than the move threshold and one more than the move threshold for going previous and next slide. And we merge them together in events so that we can handle all the subscription in one place. And then we subscribe to that and we're good to go with our keyboard navigation. Timer is a little bit special as we had the interval happening. And then we have to take until to say, okay, as soon as events is emitting something, complete the source observable. And as soon as a complete signal on the source observable is happening, repeat when it's triggered so that we can repeat our source observable then. Um, the really important thing here is that we then said, okay, as soon as the interval emits something, go to the next page. Um, minor, uh, UX tweak here was that I said, okay, when the user is on the last slide, instead of going one slide more, which is not existing, just go to the previous slide. And by merging it together with our events observable already, we are pretty good to go. And this was the code that I wanted to show you for this feature. Why I like this code is it is a fairly complex feature written with some lines of RxJS. Uh, but it also shows one of the uh, it shows really well the strengths of the IXS, which are uh, expandability. Like I, with just a few lines of code, I was able to add new feature, whole new features to my slider, to my carousel, whatever you name it. Um, and the other thing that I like about it is uh, that it really shows in a good way um, how to compose event oriented code because slider and all this kind of gestures are heavily event oriented. So this is really one of the strengths of RxJS. Okay, what I now want to do is go take a little bit of a step back from that and talk a little bit about the upcoming plans for version seven that is work in progress. So we have four big building blocks and actually the main theme of RxJS seven is improved typings. So pretty much all we do, most of it what we do is improve the typings of RxJS right now. Um, we also have one internal topic, like doing some preparations for version eight, uh, where we plan really great things for, but we want to have a more or less seamless migration. Therefore we do this step in between. Um, also we, um, we used to have, uh, pipeable concat operators in RxS five. So that you within the pipe could say at some place like concat and then it would concat the operators. Um, and those for naming collision reasons, those operators were gone in version six. And now they will come back in version seven with the suffix with. I will show that later why this is great. And what I'm really excited about is the animation frame observable. So let's take a look into these. Uh, so improved typings. Uh, one of the things that we are really proud of is. For example, when all the things where you're passing a function to uh, an operator 
could technically with a ternary if have different return types. Um, and therefore, before IHS version 7, it was evaluating that to an observable of um, object. And now it's properly inferring the type by saying, OK, it's either a string or a number. Very similar is the thing for Concat. Concat had a maximum limit of like, I think, four or five observables that you could pass there. And now this is just inferring as many observables as you're passing there. Um, it's inferring the type properly. So reduce, and the same actually goes for scan. Um, before version seven took the value of the accumulator, which kind of makes sense. So the return type was always the value specified of the accumulator. But if we look at the function here, there's no way that a string plus something is not a string. So this will always return a string uh, and not any. Before version seven, we were just relying on this accumulator type. Now we are inferring the type, and therefore um, it's properly inferred. Last thing, and this is actually kind of cool if you want to filter out not or faulty values, uh, you can now specify the constructor, for, uh, the Boolean constructor function as parameter in the filter. And before that, for um, just for typing reason, this was inferred to observable of unknown, even though filter does not change the behavior of um, or the, the return type of your observable. It just filters out some of the emissions happening on that. And now this uh, type is properly inferred, and we're good to go with that. OK, these were some of the typing stuff that we have uh, fixed with version 7. Um, now the thing that I'm the most excited about is actually the animation frame observable. And animation frame observable will emit the elapsed milliseconds at each animation frame. Short um, uh, info on the animation frame observable. It might be the case that this will come as a user-landed library and not part of RxJS core, um, as it's very difficult to test that in automated tests. Um, so we are still figuring out stuff about that. You can play around with the animation frame observable already in the current alpha or beta build. I'm not sure what's out there right now. Um, but we're still figuring out ways to provide testing mechanisms for that. Um, OK, but anyway, back to the animation frame observable because it's freaking cool. Um, so what it allows you to do is implementing, for example, such a tween function where you calculate the values based on the uh, elapsed milliseconds between any, each animation frame event. And if we would use that, for example, on a div, I now place that really hard-coded on my page um, and use that on my with my tween function. What I can do with that is build something like that. It's a super smooth animation. This might not come off with this uh, streaming input delay and whatever, but I promise you it's super smooth and it's really beautiful. And therefore, just to make sure that you saw the smoothness of it, I will replay it. So cool. OK, I really want that. Um, OK, what I meant with changes for content, Concat does not only apply to for Concat, it also goes for zip, merge, and pretty much all this, these kind of operates in that category. Um, what we have now is something like that. You can apply Concat as a static creation function, and you pass two observables, and it will create a new observable out of that. As soon as the first observable completes, it will subscribe to the second one. And for most cases, this kind of API ergonomy is totally fine. But sometimes you run into scenarios where you have operators that you want just want to apply on one observable, but not on the others. And therefore, you had to do some tweaks about that and stuff like that. And to improve the API ergonomy of that, we added concat with, again, same with zip with, depending on what kind of behavior you want. Uh, so that you, at a certain place within your pipe, can say, OK, uh, take all that and now apply concat with on that observable, and all the operators afterwards will be applied to both observables. Um, so this heavily in improves the API ergonomy of those creation functions. Okay, this is pretty much all I got in terms of code and stuff like that. So last 
thing is what I really want to encourage you. And from my point of view, the best way to learn RxJS is just building stupid stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily need to be the same, what might be beneficial for you because I shared the code. Um, you can also do similar stuff. For example, drag and drop is a really good example to learn RxJS. Type ahead search is pretty much the RxJS 101 kind of thing. Um, and what I can also recommend you to do is implement a kind of long polling behavior so that you fetch an API for several time. Because by now, I think I saw already five different kind of implementing long polling with RxJS. And every one of those had a different benefit and drawback and stuff like that. So this is pretty interesting to see. Um, I'm also very happy to support you with that. So if you're saying, OK, I want to implement drag and drop, but I'm stuck here, just feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or via mail, but probably Twitter is better. Um, again, I'm, I'm really happy to help you with that. So here are the links to the uh, slides uh, in the version that I mentioned before with the that slide that I excellently showed. Well done. Um, and here's the link to the repository. This includes the slides, the not finished source code and the finished source code. Uh, so if you want to play around with that by your own, you can also use the unfinished version. And the last thing I want to do is thank you really much for your time. I really enjoy being here. And I hope you have a great journey in RxJS, even though I know it's a very tough one. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jan. It was a nice talk. And yeah, indeed, RxJS can be a difficult subject to master. It uh, has sure. a bit steep learning curve. But once you get it, you really appreciate the beauty of it. That, that's exactly the case, right.